Hey guys, this is uh, part two of the evolution intro and evidence notes. Um, we did the first part of these notes last week. Um, and so we're going to kind of keep going with um, a little bit more about evidence of evolution and kind of how we know what we know. Um, this is always an interesting story. Uh, if you haven't heard of this, this is the flying spaghetti monster. Um, he's a deity. And... Um, Basically, what happened was uh, there is a whole, um, I mean, religion, I don't want to use that word too loosely, but uh, there is a group of people that believe in the uh, flying spaghetti monster. Uh, the religion is called uh, Pastafarianism. And so uh, what happened was uh, in the state of Kansas in 2005, uh, they were passing a law that said, that the teachers in those um, public schools had to discuss, um, if they were going to teach evolution, they also had to discuss, um, I think it was uh, intelligent design um, and kind of Christianity and how, um, you know, the religious side of things as well. They had to give them equal time. Um, the religious side and the evolution side, you had to give them equal time in class. And so, there was a guy, and off the top of my head, I don't remember his name right now. It might come to me in a minute. Um, but he said, he, he wrote the school board and said, well, you have to give time to my religion as well. Uh, and it's Pastafarianism, and our deity is the flying spaghetti monster. And this guy had an entire, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, again, I don't want to use the Bible, but he had a whole, you know, book written about his religion and, you know, how it operates and that, you know, there are believers of this. And so... Uh, you know, obviously he was just trying to make the point of, you know, well, you can't just pick one religion to, um, you know, teach in a public school, um, you know, on the other side of, on the other side of uh, evolution, you would have to teach all these different religions um, to do that. And basically his point was that, you know, there really isn't a place for religion in a public school, that those are separate topics and they should be, um, you know, learned through everyone's, you know, church or synagogue or whatever um, you get, uh, whatever religion, uh, might have. And so, um, it really got to be, uh, quite something. And I actually had a student in my class a few years ago whose dad went to Mizzou and, um, he actually wrote or, uh, wrote some of the pages in the gospel of Pastafarianism. And you can actually find this online. You can Google this and you can find the Bible of Pastafarianism. Um, and it's, um, it's kind of entertaining, um, you know, because the flying spaghetti monster, he boiled for your sins. Um, and then, uh, at the end of prayers, they say ramen, you know, so, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit funny. Um, so look it up sometime if that kind of stuff interests you, it's pretty crazy. So um, as we go through um, some more evidence here, all ideas are not equal in the, um, in the eyes of science, right? Evidence is required. And so you can't just have an idea. You can't have a thought. You have to show your evidence. You have to kind of uh, show how things go. And so the more spectacular the claim, the more spectacular the evidence must be. Okay, so that kind of goes hand in hand. Um, falsifiability experiments must have this in science. Um, and so um, I know at least my in-class kids, I've talked with them a little bit up before. And I think I'd mention it to you guys as well when you're writing your lab report that science never proves anything, uh, but it disproves things all the time, right? Like forever, people would say, you know, there's only white swans, right? There's never any other color. Well, um, you know, you don't, you, science doesn't prove that there's um, only white swans, right? Because what happens if you see a black swan, right? So seeing a black swan, that disproves things. So science disproves um, a lot of ideas all the time, but we never say it proves anything because we want to leave it open to the idea that something may come along and contradict that, that we just haven't seen yet. Um, so that's kind of a, uh, an important idea to keep in mind. Hypothesis, uh, you guys are going to be familiar with. Theory, the only thing I really want to say about that is kind of how we use the word theory, right? We use the theory in everyday language. Uh, we kind of use the theory about, you know, why uh, Bobby and, and Sue broke up, right? And somebody gives their opinion. We say, well, that's your theory. You know, well, well theory in science is much more uh, than just your opinion. A theory has like a mountain of evidence behind it. 
Okay, the Big Bang theory has a ton of evidence, like you know, hundreds or thousands of experiments and and uh, you know data points behind it. Um, so a theory in science is much more robust than it is than we use in our everyday language. Um, a law is just a fact that cannot be refuted. Um, we don't have these in bio as much. I think I mentioned that on the last uh, slideshow. We do have natural selection, but still not called a law. Um, and I already kind of went through my, it's just a theory speech. So moving on, um, lots of evidence in the fossil record, okay? So um, most of the fossils that we get are contained in sedimentary rock, okay? So new layers um, of the earth go over the old. So if you, um, you guys have all seen road cuts where you see the layers of the earth, right? So the um, fossils we find further down in those layers, those are gonna be um, older, they're gonna be have uh, lived sooner than the ones that are in the layers closer to the top of the rock. Okay, so um, we have uh, transitional fossils. Scientists love to find transitional fossils. Well, they they actually show a link between what's going on. So over here, um, Tiktaalik was actually a very famous um, transitional fossil. And so um, this guy right here, the guy in the middle. So um, and it kind of showed how things went from fish. I can't use my pen down there. How things went from a fish down here, you know, all the way up to maybe something that looked more like this um, and got to land. So this is kind of the transitional one, right? Where um, he's starting to develop other features right here. And he's kind of the, the tweener. He's in between the two of them, okay? So that's what a transitional fossil would be, where it shows you the link between a bigger change. Oops. A little too fast. So a little bit more about the fossil record. Um, horses demonstrate a lot of change over time. Um, teeth and foot bones are also used. Um, so if you look at some of these things, like this is actually down here, this guy down here, that's what, you know, a, a, an older horse would have looked like or, um, you know, many, many years ago what a horse would have looked like. And gradually their legs got longer and longer and they got more sturdy. And now, you know, we have something that looks like this, which is kind of what we're all used to seeing. But look at the teeth. Here, um, in all of these bubbles, they show you the teeth and how they've changed shape. And then they also show you the shape change and how um, there used to be toes down there and the toes ended up getting pulled in and ultimately a hoof was formed um, within that. And so a um, lot of change there. Uh, teeth are always very interesting. Um, as far as fossils go, you can learn a lot about teeth. Um, Based on the size of the tooth, you can generally learn how big the organism was. Because if you think about it, really big animals have really big teeth and really tiny animals have really tiny teeth. They're pretty proportional. We don't see really tiny animals with gigantic teeth, right? Um, that just doesn't happen. And so you can actually learn a lot about the size of the organism. You can learn about what they ate because of the shape of them. Are they more, you know, angular for tearing? Uh, like for being a meat eater, or are they more flat for grinding like they were eating plants? So you can actually learn quite a bit um, about um, an organism based on their teeth uh, and their fossils. Okay, moving on to another idea here, biogeography. Okay, this is the distribution um, of species around the planet. Okay, so, um, you know, this was a, a big part of the thinking of both Darwin and Wallace. How are how is everything distributed? What's what's um, what's the reason for why you find certain things on the world uh, in certain parts of the world and other things not? So islands were used as a lot of evidence for this, like the Galapagos Islands, right? In Australia, Australia is an island, um, and it has no larger placental mammals. There are no big mammals on Australia, but it retains the biggest percentage of mar marsupials. Okay. So um, pretty crazy that, uh, and we'll talk about us, we'll talk about the, the mammal and marsupial thing here in just a minute. But, you know, it's pretty interesting if you look over here, you have the gray fox, which actually has a little bit of red on him, um, and where he's found here in Southern California. And then you have these island foxes. And look, the islands are much more rocky and much more gray. Um, and, and even though they're called the island fox, they're much more gray than the gray fox. But look how much they blend into their environment. And you can see sort of the reddish hues back here behind this fox. And he's going to blend into his environment. So, um, you know, where where species are is kind of a big thing. So uh, here's another uh, kind of a, another slide on biogeography. And we'll talk more about Australia and the mammals and the marsupials. So if you look, 
uh, in uh, North America, we have what's called a flying squirrel, right? And, you know, you see this big flap of, of uh, skin and fur that goes between the front legs and the hind legs, and it really just forms like a big tarp between their appendages. And so it's not that they sit there and they flap them, and it's not, with, it's not like they fly. Uh, they just kind of fall with style, right, from like Buzz Lightyear. Um, so uh, in Australia, they have what's called a sugar glider. And look how similar the flying squirrel and the sugar glider are. Very similar. He also, you can see his little ruffled flap right there. He's got the same thing, a bunch of extra skin there. The only difference is this flying squirrel over here is a mammal, and this guy over here is a marsupial. So if you don't remember what a marsupial is, these would be like koalas, right? And kangaroos, things with pouches to where, you know, you birth live young, but then they crawl back into your pouch for a few months until they, um, until they grow a little bit more and they're able to get out on their own. Um, so uh, different reproductive methods for sure, but marsupials and mammals are pretty similar. There's actually other ones too. You could look up and find a lot of similar ones between Australia and the US or North America at least. Whoops, I forgot even the word convergent evolution, even though it was in bright red uh, letters there. Convergent evolution, the same or similar structure uh, is displayed by two evolutionary dissimilar organisms. Mammals and marsupials are not the same thing, but they have evolved the same features. They have evolved the same structure, like that extra skin, based on the same evolutionary pressures being put on them. Okay, So when the same pressures are put on different organisms from around the world, okay, so similar predators, similar climates, you know, things like that, food supply, um, then the same pressures are put on them, then a lot of times they adapt the same features, okay? And that's convergent evolution. If things are converging, do they get more similar or closer together, or do they get more apart if they're converging? Well, when things converge, they start farther apart and they come together and they're more and more similar, right, when they come together. So that's convergent evolution. The other one, um, the opposite of that would be divergent evolution, right? If things started very similar, but maybe something ended up getting blown to an island, and now, even though they were very similar here, and now they get apart, and they live in different places, and now there's different pressures, and they keep going more and more different, okay? If they get more and more different, that would be divergent evolution, okay? Next term up here is selective breeding, okay? so. This guy right here, selective breeding, kind of what it sounds like. Um, another word for it would be like artificial selection rather than natural selection, okay? Because this is human-driven, oh goodness, terrible line. This is human-driven natural selection, right? So um, it's us forcing natural selection to happen. And we have, um, you know, if you look down at the example down here at the bottom with the dog breeds, we do this, oh goodness, we do this all the time with our dog breeds. Um, and so I really got to get rid of this pen. Um, our dog breeds down there. We mix almost everything right now with one particular dog. And I bet some of you have this. Okay. What dog do we mix everything with? It's a poodle, right? It seems like everything, everybody now has either a, a doodle or a poo. Okay. Somehow they're mixed with that. And that's because poodles are smart. Um, they're healthy. They don't have a lot of big problems that other dogs have. They're hypoallergenic. They don't shed. There's lots of reasons to like a poodle. And so some people don't necessarily like the looks of the original poodle. So they try to cross them with other dogs because they want it to look a certain way, but they want all the traits of the poodle. Okay. Well, they used to do this back in England um, back in the day, but they also did it with pigeons. Okay, you can tell by the, the picture there, there were some designer pigeons and some of the richer people had fancy pigeons, um, just like now we have people with their fancy dog breeds. And so uh, back then it was kind of pigeons, but either way, it was, you know, it's all human driven, right? We're kind of forcing the outcome by mating particular things. Would this have happened through natural selection? Maybe. Would we have all of these dog breeds? Maybe but it might not have happened as fast, right, without humans doing it. So um, we can make um, a lot of different combinations of things. We do it with racehorses, okay? We do it with dogs, as I mentioned. There's lots of things that we do this with, and we breed things for certain outcomes. We do it with plants. So here's one example of how we've done it with plants. Um, if you look at 
um, this right here in this top left picture, this guy right here um, with the yellow flowers on the top was a wild mustard plant. Okay, and from that one plant, um, scientists crossed some things and did some, um, got the outcomes that they wanted, and we end up getting kohlrabi and kale and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cabbage and cauliflower all from this plant. Okay, all the arrows show you the part of the plant that it's coming from. And so um, we got all of this food over here, all of these vegetables from one particular plant. And uh, we've been selecting uh, certain plants and certain outcomes and crossing them to get them uh, to express certain traits about that plant. So we've been doing this for a while. This down here, um, get my pen back up here. This down here, this was corn. Okay, this was corn. It was called back in the back in the day. It was called teosinte. Okay, so the first corn used to be called teosinte, and we're talking about like the um, Indians that were in like Mexico, like Incas and Mayans back then. And so then it got a little more like corn, and then eventually it got to where it looks a lot more like corn on the cob, like, like, like what we're used to seeing. Okay, But a lot of this was done through human interaction. So there's a lot of people out there that, you know, will talk about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, and how they don't like that food is being genetically modified. We've been doing this for a thousand years. It's just we can do it much faster now with technology. So... Um, I mean, it's been going on through through the times of humans that we've been messing with plants and uh, plants genetics. It's just we've been doing it at a much slower pace, and now we can do it a lot faster. Whoops, I'm sorry. There was one more graph on there, just kind of showing you how we've um, how we've even messed with the corn, where we can um, we can breed corn with high oil on uh, oil content or low oil content. So, you know, we can really um, even pick out particular traits within a plant and either express them or not um, in order to get um, a certain outcome that we want. All right, moving on to anatomical evidence. So um, this is more probably what, um, what I grew up looking at as far as like when we were looking at similarities of, um, of animals and how they were related to each other. It was almost always about their anatomy. And so even when I was in high school and college in our anatomy classes, it was more about comparing the anatomy because we didn't have the genome yet. We didn't have the ability to compare uh, DNA and proteins. And so everything was still based on structure. So if you look at um, the picture here, so you have a human, you have a turtle, you have a bat, and you have a whale. So we got, you know, the arm, kind of the forearm of the turtle, the wing of the bat, and the flipper of the whale. But if you look at the structure, the humus, the radius, the ulna, the carpal, the metacarpal, and the phalanges, they show up in every one of these. And despite that one is using it for swimming and one's using it for flying, and this guy kind of crawls around and, you know, we use it for all sorts of um, grasping and, you know, um, all sorts of things. Um, the functions are there. It's, it's the structures are so similar, right? This would be um, what's called a homologous structure because, um, they're they're just so similar in the uh, in the structure, and then the functions are also very uh, very similar as well. So that kind of shows you a little chart there um, about where uh, where some things would be uh, related and how um, we used to look at these charts and how um, kind of the structure of things were informing us how we'd put them on like the tree of life and how related they were. And you know it turns out we were right about a lot of those, but some of them we weren't quite right about once we got to look at DNA. Vestigial structures, structures that um, no longer have a current function. Um, they, they were in um, organisms and still are in organisms, but they just don't have a function anymore. If you look at um, a whale and you look at their skeleton, they actually have a femur and a pelvis bone. Why on earth would a whale have a femur and a pelvis bone that looks like this? Well, it's because, look at where it's located too. Well, it's because they used to be land creatures and they would have legs coming out of there. Terrible looking leg, I know, but they would have uh, an appendage coming out of here uh, when they were walking on land. 
and they were giant land mammals, right? Whales are still mammals. And so um, you can actually look up, uh, maybe I'll post a link if I find it again, uh, I'll post the link for you guys to see it. There's um, like some uh, animations where it shows you kind of how whales evolved um, to get into the ocean from the land. Um, we also have, um, this is probably the one you guys are really familiar with too, being the appendix. You may know someone that had their appendix out. Well, you do know someone that had their appendix out, because I did. So um, this little part down here, it works kind of like a trap coming off your, your intestines. And I don't know if any of you know what the appendix is uh, was used for back then. Um, but the idea is the appendix has a lot of really harsh enzymes in it. And you may have heard, like, if your appendix bursts inside you, you're in big trouble. And that's because it has a lot of harsh enzymes. So if those get into your body, uh, it can be really harmful to you. So um, what those harsh enzymes used to do is digest all the bacteria that would come from eating raw meat. And so um, if you think back to early human life, you know, it used to be kill an animal and then eat that animal right there on the spot. There wasn't a lot of cooking involved in it. And, you know, sometimes no fire at all. And so um, we had much stronger uh, digestive system. We had these enzymes back then to deal with the bacteria um, that came with eating raw meat. And that was a way to keep us healthy um, because those harsh enzymes would then um, take care of all that bacteria for us. And there's there's lots of, uh, there's, um, you know, several examples of vestigial structures. Goosebumps are actually uh, another example, right? Humans are not as hairy as they used to be, you know, years and years ago. Um, and when you think about um, like maybe your cat, what happens when your cat gets cornered and gets scared? The hair on its neck goes up, kind of punches up and tries to make itself look bigger and scarier and it's got all its hair sticking up. Well, that's because, you know, it's kind of part of the fight or flight mechanism. And so it would have been the same for humans as well. Um, so goosebumps. And they also have a little bit to do with uh, when you get cold, right? Sometimes you get goosebumps when you get cold. And so there's some thought that, you know, the air pockets and the hairs and all of that tend to bring a little bit more warmth to the skin um, for when you get cold. But for the most part, uh, they're just kind of useless now where they used to actually serve a purpose. So real quick, go back to homologous. So homologous, right? Kind of uh, same structures derived from a com common ancestor, very similar structure with a common ancestor, vestigial, no real function anymore. And now we have analogous, right? So these terms sound very same. So make sure you're keeping them very, um, uh, very straight in your mind what they're there for. So analogous um, structures are going to be similar structures resulting from similar adaptation. So similar evolutionary pressures cause the same adaptations to develop, kind of like convergent evolution. Um, Different structure, different development, similar function. Okay, so um, evidence of convergent evolution, um, analogous structures are evidence of convergent evolution. If you look at the eye down here, um, you might think humans have the most um, developed eye and the most advanced eye. Here's our eye right here, okay, the human eye, and then down here is the um, octopus eye as well. And so if you look in the human eye, Right back here at number four, where it has this bracket going across right here, um, you'll notice that there is no um, there is no retina back there. There is no um, see the little um, yellow parts behind the darker yellow part or browner part there. Um, notice this is our what comes in the back of our eye. That's our optic nerve, right? And so right here we actually have a blind spot. Okay. But if you look at the octopus eye, their optic nerve kind of stops and goes behind the lighter yellow stuff. So they're in they're in reverse there, right? The our, our lighter yellow stuff sits behind, darker in front. Over here, it's the other way around. So now theirs comes, and they don't have a blind spot, right? You guys have probably all um, you know done a little blind spot test with your peripheral vision, like you can put your finger out here. At some point, your finger will disappear and then reappear because it hits your blind spot and you can't sort that out. Um, there's also a couple other tests you can do. Google like how to tell where your eye's blind spot is. Um, you kind of, I think it's about, you put two objects on a piece of paper about five inches apart and you stare at the one right in front of you and put the other outside. And as you bring it closer, that object on that piece of paper on the other side will uh, disappear and then reappear. 
And so uh, you could probably Google that pretty quick to see um, how you actually have a blind spot. And our brains just fill in the general pixel color that's around there. So if you're you know, staring at something white or gray or whatever, your brain just kind of fills in the, the fuzzy colors around that. And because our heads move all the time, our blind spots move all the time, and our brain just constantly fills that in, we don't really notice that we have them, but we do. So here's a good example of analogous structure, right? So these um, are definitely not the same um, structure, okay? But they are the same function. So an insect wing and a pterosaur wing and a bird wing and a bat wing, none of them are made the same, okay? You would not say that these are homologous. The bone structure is not the same. Some of them don't have bones, okay? The insect doesn't have bones in his wings, okay? So some of these do. Um, but they're they're made completely different. So analogous structures is not not built the same, but they do have the same function, right? Because flying is really cool. Flying is a big advantage um, for organisms to be able to fly. And so uh, wings evolve several different times uh, throughout history um, on different organisms, and they came out different ways, different structures. Okay, so that's analogous. Another quick example of analogous as well. We have um, a dolphin and a shark, right? Like really, really similar organisms. Same evolutionary pressures, same environment. One's a mammal, one's a fish, right? So um, not entirely the same, um, but they've evolved a lot, a lot of the same features uh, based on their being in the same environment. Comparative embryology. So if I didn't have a picture, if I could have gotten a picture where, you know, I could X out these words right here and you couldn't tell what what was a pig or a human or a reptile or a bird and you were just looking at these pictures, these embryos, I doubt you could have told me which one was a bird or a reptile or a human or a pig. Um, I'm pretty sure, um, you know, that would have been pretty impossible for you guys to get those right. Um, our development is really similar um, across um, kind of the animal kingdom um, where everything kind of develops the same. And it's because we share a lot of the same genes that govern development and govern how our embryos are formed. Okay, get rid of my pen before it lets me click. So gill slits or pharyngeal pouches, um, not a big question here. Don't worry about this really. Um, we do have some sort of gill slits um, even in human, you'll notice gill pouches right here up behind like where our ears would have been or are, um, and they close up. For us, they close up uh, for everything but really fish, right? They kind of close up, um, but we do have remnants of them uh, that were related to things that, you know, would have had gills and stuff like that. So really, this is kind of the, the best way to look at things now is looking at the molecular record and the DNA code. So. Um, life uses a universal code, and we compare the DNA and protein sequences. And we actually do this in a database called BLAST. Um, there is a lab for this coming up. I'm not entirely sure if we're going to be able to do it because you have to have Excel. And I know uh, Chromebooks don't have Excel. Uh, you guys have Google Sheets, but the formulas work differently in Excel. So I don't know if we're going to be able to do that or not, or if I'm going to be able to give you some data on it or something like that. But um, I'll see what I can do on that lab coming up. But it's a pretty interesting lab. Be able to sit there and compare all of these sequences in there and see how real scientists um, use this database. So, um, no matter what the no matter what the organism is, bacteria or fungus or bird or fish or whatever, it all uses the same DNA um, bases. And so, um, you know, there's really this universal code for how to make proteins um, and how ribosomes make proteins and then how things function. So. If given the correct code, a bacteria can make a human protein. We do this all the time. Um, if we want to study a protein and we want a lot of it made, we don't pull it out of a lot of humans. We take the little uh, piece of DNA out that we want. We put it in a bacteria and bacteria reproduce overnight like thousands of copies. And so um, we do this all the time in labs um, because things do use the exact same bases um, it's very easy to kind of do that and manipul manipulate that in the lab. That's just kind of the genetic code chart, right? With the amino acids, nothing too important right now.
more on the molecular record. Um, you know, species more closely related have more genetic similarities, and species further apart on the tree have more accumulated differences. So if you look, there's a bunch of numbers all over this chart, and I don't expect you to like know them or memorize them or anything, but just the basic concept. If things are really closely related, would they have um, a higher percent of their DNA matching or a lower percent? Clearly, it's going to be the higher, right? So the closer things are, like all the types of foxes, right? They're going to be really close, and they're only going to have, you know, a small percentage of um, DNA bases be different, where, you know, if you look at, like, you know, a fox and a bear, they're going to be farther apart than a, a, a fox and a dog or something like that. So um, it just kind of, this one's kind of common sense. The more mutations, the more genetic differences there are, the farther apart you're going to be on that evolutionary So there's a question. If I gave you sequences to look at, how could you tell which organisms diverged more recently? Look at how many changes there were, how many mutations there are, um, how similar are the sequences. So it's fairly easy to tell if you can have those sequences and look, look at the percents of similarity. It's pretty easy to figure that out. Um, just another example for you. So um, looking at the percent of amino acids that are identical to the amino acids in human hemoglobin. So Hemoglobin is that protein um, that uh, binds oxygen in our red blood cells. So obviously, okay, so we have the human sequence would be identical to a human by 100%, right? So a rhesus monkey is 95% the same as a human. A mouse is 87. The chicken is 69. The frog is 54. And even this thing called a lamprey, which is a jawless fish that's like prehistoric, uh, has 14% the same. But look, even down here, the second one, a frog, over half, okay, over half of the amino acids that we have, that frog has, right? And a lot of these are much higher than that. And they're much more similar uh, in their sequence that they need to produce um, the hemoglobin as we do. So um, we're not very far apart from organisms on a lot of these things. Um, same kind of thing, just looking at... The differences on chromosome one, two, and three in the banding patterns, nothing particular I need you to pick up. Just kind of looking at the banding patterns between humans and chips and gorillas and orangutans. And you can look at those patterns and kind of see how some things are a little bit more similar than others um, as you look through. And, you know, we'll, I know there's down there on the chromosome three, there's an inversion. We'll worry about that stuff later when we get to genetics. Um, but just kind of, this is one way people look at the molecular record and see how similar things are or how different they are. A um, little example of observe evolution. So um, some people say that, you know, uh, evolution works so slow we can't see it. And, and for a lot of things, that's true, that it takes, you know, thousands of years for something to change and we don't really notice it. But for other things, they happen much faster. And so the peppered moth is a really good example. You can see um, there's dark and light variants and, you know, early in, oops, early in, um, in early England there in the 1800s. Okay, so here's the peppered, uh, peppered one that looks lighter and then the, obviously you have the dark one. And you can see the dark one on the tree really well over here and it's really easy to pick out. But over here, this guy is much harder to pick out, right? So there's the peppered moth on that tree because a lot of these trees are covered with lichens. Um, and that's what makes their bark white. And so the peppered moth really blends in. So what happened is in the early 1800s, before the Industrial Revolution, there was low pollution. So the lichens uh, made the trees really lightly colored. Lichens are a combination. Um, they're like um, an algae and a protist that grow together. And they form a symbiotic relationship and they grow on trees a lot of times. Okay, uh, Rocks as well. And so... Later on, though, so early 1800s, trees are light colored. So you had mostly peppered moths, right? Late 1800s, Industrial Revolution starts, lots of pollution. Trees get coated in soot, so they get a lot darker. The lichen died. So what happens is you have um, the dark colored, you have the dark colored moth here start to succeed a lot more because he can blend in. And so um, a lot of the peppered moth population went down and the darker ones came up. And then now, you know, 100 years later, a lot of pollution controls, lower pollution due to clean air laws, the lichen return, the bark 
it is now light again, and now you see much more of these guys that have made their way back into the population. So now fewer dark ones again and more pepper moths again. That's, you know, evolution right in front of your eyes. That's how things, that's natural selection at work uh, right in front of you. And, and so some things we can observe, um, and, uh, and it's, it's pretty clear what's going on. So as far as misconception uh, review here, a couple, couple things to note. Um, evolution is not goal-oriented. No teleology, and teleology just means that, you know, something is going, it's striving for something or having a goal. Um, evolutionary trends do not mean there is a goal. Organisms are not striving to be perfect. They are striving to survive, okay? They're not trying to be the prettiest thing, um, or the strongest or the fastest, they just get traits and they deal with them the best they can. And their goals are to survive and pass on their traits. That's all they want to do is survive and reproduce. So there's really no goals. A lot of this is just somewhat random on how these things show up because the process of copying DNA can make some random mistakes. And sometimes you get some good things out of that and sometimes you get some bad things out of that. So evolution can only work in the present, not the future. It has no idea what's going to happen okay, down the road. There's no master plan. There's nothing it's going for. It just happens. It just changes um, as the DNA changes, as the traits are passed down generation to generation. Would there, a question for you, would there be dead branches on the tree of life if organisms were only improving? If organisms were only improving, then why did species go extinct, right? So not everything had, had good changes. Not everything is, you know, on the upward trend there. Um, some things um, don't evolve quick enough and they end up dying out. And that may happen to polar bears pretty soon if they can't adapt uh, to the warmer temperatures and the less sea ice in a different diet um, because they can't hunt like they're used to, then we're going to lose polar bears, right? So, um, you know, they're, they're not as perfect as they thought in their cold environment because it's not going to be cold anymore, not, not um, cold enough. And so... Um, that's really going to be, you know, a big problem up here. I do like this picture down here in the bottom corner, um, you know, because there's a there's a quote here. Here's you, you know, you have this frog, and what do frogs do at night? A lot of times is they're, you know, they're chirping and they're calling and they're having all these mating calls, right? Because you want to survive and reproduce, you want to pass on your traits, so you're making mating calls. The problem is, you know, one thing's mating call is another thing's dinner bell. You know, he's giving away his position while he's calling. And so bats are, you know, even though it's the middle of the night, bats have the um, the ability to track them, right, without seeing them. And so they can come down and, and get them. So kind of an interesting thing where they're trying to, you know, do the natural selection thing and survive and reproduce, but then it doesn't always work out that way. So you can have a lot of things go wrong in natural selection as well. Would fish lose eyes if they were working on perfection? You know, some fish that have gone deeper and deeper in the ocean where there's no light, they used to have eyes and now they don't. And so that doesn't seem like it's goal oriented, right? That doesn't seem like a good way to go. Uh, you know, not, not having eyes going forward. So uh, they just don't need them anymore. And so it just didn't, didn't end up being a trait that was necessary to pass on. Intelligent design, you may have heard of this um, and you may have done a, uh, a misconception paragraph on it if you chose that. Uh, but intelligent design is a belief that life is so complex that it must have had an intelligent designer, right? So sometimes religious people will say, you know, I, I believe in evolution. I just think that God or, or, or whatever deity put things in motion in a particular way and that all the dominoes fell just perfectly, right? And so, you know, there's other people have problems with that way of thinking. Um, you know, if you were designing something this important, would there be significant flaws in the design? So if it was an intelligent designer, you know, would they have only given us one way to get air into our lungs? We only have one windpipe and it doesn't take much but a piece of food to block that and then we can choke and die. And so, you know, there's other design. Like if you were going to be an architect of the body, you would probably build, you know, another way, like kind of like miners build a secondary shaft for air in case there's a cave in. They always have a secondary shaft going for air. So we don't have that secondary shaft. So we can choke. Um, it's not a great design. Right. And uh, we also have a lot of, um, you know, heart issues. Um, we get a lot of blockages and stuff like that. So um, there could be 
um, better designed um, organs and stuff like that that would have prevented a lot of this. So um, just, you know, a little food for thought there. And then I just kind of threw this in there, do aesthetics uh, not count either. So, you know, if you're going for perfection and the people that say, you know, evolution as organisms are just, you know, you know, everything's a goal and it's trying to be perfect. You, you don't see that on these pictures, right? You have your goblin shark and your your um, star nose mole and your red face monkey and your naked mole rat, your proboscis monkey there with the giant honker. Uh, and then you have your hairless cat. And then some sort of dog over here in the corner. That is a dog. Uh, I could not tell you what kind of dog. But um, anyway, you know, if there was an intelligent designer or something like that, you know, generally you would make things a little prettier than uh, than what some of these guys got. So anyway, a um, bunch of stuff, bunch of terms. Okay, So there's a lot of terms this week. So make sure you go back through. And uh, really your, your main part of your homework this week is, you know, whether it's Quizlet or writing stuff down or making tables or um, making, uh, you know, graphic organizer, stuff like that. And make sure you're getting these terms down because it's going to be a quiz on Friday and it's going to have a lot of these terms, okay? All right, well, I hope that uh, was helpful for you guys and uh, have a good day.